All right, I am Andrew McConville. I'm an artist, a designer, a coder, a maker. And for the past few years, I've been in the MFA program here at UWM making unconventional input devices, which you may or may not define as a keyboard. And so we'll be looking at a few of those today and the process that I've used to build them. We're seeing one of those here. This is a, a prototype that I built and it's now on display uh, as part of a much larger installation at Deep Lake Future in the VAR Gallery on 5th and Pierce. This is also another keyboard um, installed at the same location. We'll take a look at that. And then another work that is currently in progress and we'll see where that is. And so a little origin story for my artist talk. I was, I grew up uh, in a Navy family. And so I moved a ton, uh, lived in several different states, even lived in Italy for a little while, even though I was three, so it really doesn't count. But I went to nine different schools and I kind of wrapped that up here in Wisconsin, in Milwaukee. I went to South Division and then I went to Brookfield East. And so I like to think that like all that culture hopping kind of helped me as a, a designer. And a majority of my experience, my professional experience is in UX design designing uh, websites and web apps. And so because of all that moving, I got really into computers and model making. And also, you know, when you move a ton, there's a lot of downtime while you get to a new place and have to figure out, you know, the lay of the land and make new friends and all that. And so I spent a lot of time on the computer. And then as time went on, I discovered AOL, America Online, and the internet. And so the internet also became a huge part of my life, probably why I got into web apps and the web in general. And so jumping back over to keyboards, um, in the MFA program here at UWM, I took a class, uh, Writing for the Arts. And in that class, we had a small project, but it was very open. And it was to just make a work of art on the topic of writing. And I ended up building this. I never really thought I would get into keyboards like what we're about to see. But this is the first keyboard that I had made, which I think is a keyboard. It's kind of a keyboard. It looks like a keyboard. It has the layout of one anyways. Um, but having, you know, a background in user experience design, I'm often trying to find the best experience for the user. And on the quest to find the best experience, un unfortunately, you have to abandon lots of like exciting and radical and potentially risky ideas in favor of designing something that is, you know, very familiar and very typical and, and user friendly for the user. And with this project, I kind of wanted to go off into one of those unconventional and radical ideas. And so I wanted to explore the activity of typing. Uh, you know, it's something that a lot of us do. It's something that I had been doing a lot of at the time. And I wanted to see what it would be like to type without pushing a button. And this does work. The keyboard does work. It is wired up to an Arduino, that green little computer there. And so it can be plugged into a desktop or a laptop. And I have to say it is a horrible experience. Well, it's not, yeah, it's horrible. The first five or six keystrokes are pretty fun, but then after that, it does it does get pretty horrible. But either way, good or bad, um, you know, this approach to input, it definitely changes how you are physically and mentally engaging with the act of writing. You know, this thing slows you down. And that's important to mention because, you know, the, the tools that we have available to us, they shape our actions and they shape how we think. And so I have a, a background in UX design. And so when I'm trying to problem solve, you know, I think in terms of design and in software. And, you know, if, if you have like a pen and piece of paper available to you, you know, you can choose to write with it, of course, but you can always choose to stop writing and start drawing or maybe you start writing sideways up the page. And so, you know, what we have access to shapes our perception, perceptions of what's possible. And this, this includes the keyboard for sure. Um, and, you know, throughout this talk, I'll do a lot of talking about how my <clears throat> my art practice and my design practice revolve around human activities, which I think is definitely a side effect from moving so much and, you know, spending a lot of time people watching, um, which I still enjoy to this day, although now I can call it research. And so let's take a second to look at process, because when I watch artist talks, I, I love to hear about their process and, and how they make and, and what inspires them. And so for me, I do a lot of prototyping. I do a lot of back and forth. I'll make a little bit and then I'll analyze and then I'll make, and then I'll analyze. And this can be like just totally technical. Like I'll make something and then look at it and what needs to be made next? How am I going to build this thing? How is, how is the structure going to come about to support all the different parts that I have? Or it can be super conceptual. Um, you know, just take a step back and 
is the thing that I'm doing, is it doing what I want or is it doing something that like I never even considered and now suddenly there's a new potential that kind of just presented itself right there, which we'll see in uh, later projects. And so make and analyze a lot of back and forth with that, kind of with writing too. You know, you write a lot and then you edit, write and edit. You're not supposed to edit as you write. And so here's a couple tiny little prototypes because this project was so short lived. Um, and the top right, just experimenting with, I, I have a toggle switch. I've never really used a toggle switch before, but how big is it? What, what kind of enclosure or structure am I going to put it in? So this is 3D printed and then I made one. And so then I made two. And then I wanted like a little shroud over the top of it. And then I deconstructed. So I'm building something, but I'm also like taking things apart. Like, I don't know how this thing works. Like what's, what's happening here. So there's a lot of that too, a lot of taking apart. And then it's in this picture, in the end, we'll see that I, I ended up switching over to that classic computer beige, which is mm, an interesting color. But nonetheless, I should also say that I take a lot of, from my design practice, I use design thinking in my art making as well. And so before I started making keyboards and, and physical interfaces, um, <clears throat> you know, I made a lot of web apps and user interfaces. And in software design, uh, design the design thinking methodology is super popular. Lots of tech companies use it. We use it where I work. And I've started to take this project into my art making. And we'll see how that kind of plays a role here in a little while. But what what does UX design actually look like? There's kind of a misconception, I think, of when you are making software that you're just sitting at your computer in like Illustrator or XD or Sketch or Figma or something like that. But that is definitely not the case at all. This, this is what software actually looks like. Um, <clears throat> and so this is a photo that I took at a startup that I joined. So I, I graduated from UWM with a BFA in design and visual communication in 2013. And after that, I joined a startup and this is what the process looks like when we are designing software. So, you know, it's, it's a lot of just talking to people and gathering knowledge and being a facilitator of meetings and building prototypes and then testing those prototypes with people and then iterating on the prototype and then testing it again. And, you know, I guess so in that regard, if there's one thing you're going to take away from this talk, it'll be show your work to somebody, just show it to anybody. Um, I'm not talking like a full research project with hundreds of participants, like three, four, five people, you know, themes and ideas and feedback will start to coalesce. And, and I bet you'll get some, some unexpected findings, whether they're good or bad. <clears throat> and so I've tried to bring a lot of that design thinking, a lot of those activities that I do into my artwork so I can get a sense of, you know, what's happening and what am I doing? Where is it going? Uh, where do I work? I said a tech company in Wisconsin. Yes, they do exist. I work at a company called Acculinks. We make roofing software, so nothing too fancy. It's basically if you owned a roofing company, this would be everything you need to run that company, software that would help you run it. And so there's tons of dashboards and like calendars and photo sharing and lots of forms and modals and buttons and all that kind of stuff. Lots of data visualizations. Uh, we have a slide though, so that's kind of cool. Uh, when I did first start, it was a strip mall with one big room and a bunch of people with all of our desks put together. But we eventually moved out of that space. And of course you buy a slide. Why do you buy a slide? I have no idea. It's just weird things tech companies do. Uh, eventually we moved into another space and yes, we brought the slide with us. But jumping back into the next keyboard or not a keyboard. This is still kind of a keyboard. It almost reads as a keyboard. It definitely doesn't have that layout anymore, but the keys, the keys themselves are still there. And so what you also might notice is that I work with a lot of manufactured parts. Um, so off the shelf parts like here, servos, pulleys, wires, <clears throat> and stuff like that. And I enjoy doing that uh, one because it, it makes the, the object look like it was manufactured. Like this came off of a, fa of a factory, um, out of a factory. And like the viewer looks at it and it's like, oh, is this a thing that really exists? Are these things out in the world? Are these being produced by the thousands and they're everywhere and I've just never seen them before? Um, so it's a nice entry point into the work to kind of grab a, a viewer's attention. But also a lot of that inspiration, I think comes from open source and open source culture. And so in the programming world, there's this idea that all code should be transparent and all code should be viewable by anyone. If you're wondering how somebody programmed some app that you're looking at, you should be able to go and look at the code. And I love that. 
because that's how I learned to code. I just looked at what other people had written and, oh, that's how you do it. And so I kind of like my work to take on that, that aesthetic as well. <clears throat> And so kind of what I talked about earlier is, you know, technology, it dictates how we think. So language, writing, tools, interface, they all dictate what's possible. And we start to, after a while, we start to think in terms of them. And so here, again, with this keyboard, calling attention to the, the human act of typing, which is like, it's a very human thing that we do. Um, you know, there's us and plants and animals, we all sleep and eat and grow, but typing is like our thing. And keyboards are everywhere. You are probably sitting in front of a keyboard right now. And if you're not, there's probably one in your pocket. And so these things are just everywhere and we don't usually consider them all that often. And so how do I go about making these projects or this project? I, I do sketch a little bit and then I also arrange parts and so i know there's going to be certain parts that i want so here the the blue object is a servo motor and then there's the key and the key switch itself and like um, maybe there's some wire that will happen to pull the key down by itself and so i'll sketch a little bit and then i'll lay my items out kind of arrange them and figure out how things are going to fit together because i'm not a maker traditionally and so you know in the real world you have to contend with things like like gravity like if i put a button on a computer screen the button's just going to stay there it's not going to move and you can put buttons on buttons on buttons and, and nothing ever happens on a screen but in the real world it's it's very different so that's something i need to consider and then i pretty quickly jump into rhino or fusion i also consider this to be to be sketching as well because here i'm just printing prototypes and so this is a 3d printer here uh, coming up with one of those first prototypes and then I have something and this first something is usually you know it's just a proof of concept like like total technical execution like I know I want a key to go down by itself and I know there's going to be something that has to do that so first like let me just solve that problem and we come up with with something like this this is the first prototype and so that's one key that goes down by itself and then so here are three keys that go down by themselves. And this is where this keyboard starts to get a little bit creepy. And so the sound is here now. <clears throat> and I didn't expect sound. And I honestly, with this project, spent a lot of time, several weeks, trying to get rid of the sound, trying to figure out how to make the sound not be there. And this one also, when there was one, it was kind of neat. But when there was three and they're kind of going independently and doing their own thing, I think that's also what the feedback I started to get was this thing is kind of weird. It's making this sharp, piercy, grindy sound. These keys are kind of just doing what they want. Um, it's, it's, it, it started to get interesting, I would say. And then so I had to scale it up, right? I did one key, I did three, and then so I wanted to take it up to six, eventually to get to all 26 characters at least. And here in this project and in the um, <clears throat> in the other prototypes too, you'll notice that there's these, these little, these are photo sensors on top of each of the keys. And, and what I was gonna do initially is the viewer would go to bring their hand or their finger towards one of the buttons and it would depress by itself. But what I found when I showed this to people is that they played it like an instrument. Uh, once they realized that the keys would depress by themselves when they got close to it, they would take their hand and they would wave it back and forth. And that, that interactivity and the sound, again, that it made from users doing that, or viewers, users, viewers in this case, I don't know, kind of interchangeable, um, was also very unexpected and very interesting. But also another thing to note, at that point, I was trying to make like the layout of a keyboard, which really looking back didn't make any sense like why am i trying to recreate the keyboard the keyboard already exists i don't need to recreate that layout i don't need to reuse that layout i can do anything i want and so then i started to kind of open it up to well what if i just did like a linear keyboard what could that look, look like and so here i took all the the layout of a traditional keyboard and i squished them all down into a line and here's a couple other um <clears throat> ideas of how i might lay out the keys and the servos a little bit of illustrator and then a little bit of sketching and so when the when I had seen people using um, that six key prototype like a musical instrument, I thought, well, maybe maybe they could be arranged in like some kind of circle, like a conductor um, in an orchestra. And then there was also like the idea, well, maybe I should have a screen there so we can see what letter is actually being um, depressed by itself or maybe what the message actually is. 
And then I moved on to, <clears throat> I didn't have the layout yet, but I moved on to this version, which is, okay, I don't know the layout exactly yet, but I do know I want all 26. So what is it going to take um, technically to get all 26 of these happening? And <clears throat> for me, this is the creepiest one. Because when you use this one, there's like this chorus. And so right now, all 26 of these are connected to just the one sensor that I'm holding in my hand in this video. And it's like this chorus of the machine uprising. It's, it's kind of strange. It's like a theremin, but I guess a light theremin. But it is, as creepy as it is, it is... It's like also oddly satisfying to have this like affective sensation to control these things in real time via via direct manipulation there. And you know, the this whole like action at a distance, it kind of feels odd, yet it kind of feels empowering. I'm just over here wiggling my finger and yet all these things are like responding to that. Um kind of far, not far away, but you know, not directly moving by my hand touching them. So this one was weird, but I like this one. It was enjoyable. And so a little more prototyping then. I knew I didn't want that boxy um, design that was all the way on the left. And so here we can see just a bunch of little tweaks along the way. Um, you probably don't even notice too many tweaks from one version to the next, but definitely from the first to the last, you'll see there's a difference. And so this is something I recommend to always like keep prototyping, keep um, I, these are sketches. These are like 3D sketches. Don't just model it and print it and call it done. Like keep going. Uh, these are the eventual little modules that I came up with. And I went with modules because one, it kind of broke the work down and, and made it a lot easier to approach. But then also at the same time, <clears throat> you know, this is kind of how our world is. We live in this, this assembled world where everything is made out of parts and all those parts are brought into components and all those components are brought into bigger things and things just kind of build up from there. Um, although a lot of that is hidden from us nowadays, like so much of the, of the, anything that we buy is, is hidden under a, a cover or a bezel or, or some kind of, kind of shroud. So again, I wanted that to be open. And so I left all my work open and then sometimes the work is just doing work. So then once I kind of knew what I wanted to do, I had to had to sit down and do it. <clears throat> um, and there's a lot of soldering here, like 800 solder points or so, um, a bunch of wires that need to connected connectors added to them. Cause it was all custom wiring, custom lengths. And there's definitely over 200 of those here. Um, and here's the final piece. It has a very satisfying sound. And it's doing what we do. It's typing. And so there's the servos here, which the noise is about, I'd say 70% servo, 30% key that clicks. I got these really clicky keys that have a, a little, um, a little mechanism, mechanism in them that makes, uh, even more noise than they should. But this keyboard is, you know, it's engaging in human activity. It's, it's typing and you know, it's interesting because you step back and you look at it and, it, and it's, it's kind of a moment to consider our relationship with technology. And there's yet this aspect of it. People say it's alive. Uh, lots of people say that when they see it, because it is, you know, there's no human present and it's just doing what it's doing. And it has this, it is kind of a regular motion, but it's also somewhat irregular as it goes through the keys. And I added the lights so you could see um, which keys were being depressed because it does happen kind of fast. And then I kind of turned that into a loader bar, which then almost kind of looked like a typewriter, like a carriage return when you get to the end of it. And so it kind of started doing lots of interesting things for me. But I wanted to know what it was doing for other people. And so <clears throat> here I am. This is the setup for an affinity mapping exercise that um, we typically do in UX design. And so critique is great, but the one downside of critique is you need artists and designers who know how to critique. It's like a learned skill to be able to critique well, and you can't, you can't just critique with anybody. And so I thought, well, maybe let me bring in some of my design um, <clears throat> thinking activities because when I do, when I show work to non-designers, you know, I'm just showing it to regular people and, and they don't know anything about design or art or nor do they really care. They just want the thing that I'm building to work. And so in this activity, um, a bunch of fellow grads came into my studio and I turned the keyboard on and I let it 
type or play or, you know, do whatever it does. And all I asked was to just write down a word, write down whatever word you feel, write it down on a post-it note, stick it to the wall. And then after a few minutes, we had done that. And so then I took all the words and kind of affinity mapped them to, to themes. And so some of them, some of those themes are like noise, noisy sound. And so we group all those together. And then down on the bottom, the bottom right, there was tons, tons and tons of sticky notes about the body, like that yellow one right there with the three dots on it says human body. And then everything under that is bodily related, which is interesting because there is no body in this work. The human is absent here. And so the, the green dots, so what inevitably happens is we group all these together and then we take a step back and we look at it. And then people are like, oh, I love that word. I wish I picked it. Oh, I love that word. I wish I picked it. And then so we go back and we vote on which theme is like really speaking to us. And so, yeah, I thought the, the bodily stuff, the human aspect to it, um, how it was so, so heavily weighted towards that, um, super interesting. Also on the far right, you know, there's ideas of the uncanny and emotion and isolation. And so this, this project does a lot of different things for a lot of different people. More feedback yet. Um, <clears throat> you know, for me, I kind of, it's almost like a, I call it the typing, the ultimate contemporary human activity. But, you know, in some regards, it's it's almost like a self-portrait of of me and like all of us, right? That's like what we're doing, typing and scrolling and typing and scrolling. Um, but I also showed it to somebody else in the computer science department and they read it as as a device, like an output device for the blind. It, it's a keyboard, so it's an input device, but it, yet it is acting as output as it's displaying the messages to us. And so this person kind of thought like, oh, well, you could put your hands on it and you could feel the message being typed back to you. Um, super interesting. I had never even considered that and would have never come upon it had I not shown this to somebody. Uh, workplace dystopia. Yes, I totally get that. And I totally agree with that. Um, that's a whole nother artist talk, um, to talk about, <clears throat> you know, our attachment to our labor and the autonomy that we have, or that we don't have these days when we do work. A lot of people just read it as like sublimely hypnotizing, you know, the spectacle of the whole thing. There's, it has everything to it. There's lights, there's sounds, there's rhythm, there's motions and movements. Um, and it, it's just fun to watch and listen to. And then, yes, I do acknowledge that it is creepy. Although I think the final one is not so creepy as some of the other iterations. Um, but yeah, I can definitely see how it is somewhat weird, somewhat uncanny, somewhat creepy, and a little bit uncomfortable for some people. Okay, so next project. This one is, this one's a work in progress. And so, <clears throat> so you know, I did that first keyboard, which had the layout of a keyboard, but not the buttons. And then the second one, which kind of went by itself, but the second one had A through Z. And there are so many other keys on a keyboard currently or in the past. The keyboards like 10, 20, 30 years ago had a lot of different keys um, that don't exist on modern keyboards anymore. And the modern keyboard, when it transitioned to the phone, your phone keyboard, your phone keyboard is mostly like just the alphabet and numbers. There's a ton of keys that yet again, did not make that transition. And kind of like a ton of keys that were added, like emoji, like you're on your phone, like emoji could be the way that you talk and respond, um, emoji and meme with people. But again, right, it's coming back to the tools that we have kind of shape the way we think and, and put us in somewhat a mode of thinking and kind of dictate what's possible for us. And so in this project, I'm trying to figure out, you know, where do I want to go with that? Am I, am I like, burying these keys? Am I putting them to rest? Am I retiring them? Or maybe I should be welcoming in emoji and maybe I should do a whole series on that. Um, but again, it's like this evolution of our tools, which is an evolution of, of our relationship with tech and how we, how we communicate with each other and, and what's available to us. And so here, these next couple slides, I wanted to show them as a process book. So these are spreads from, um, the process book that I have been working on for this project. And I know a lot of designers here do process books. Um, I also do as well. I personally, I love process books. I love documenting my work. Uh, sometimes I love the process book and the documentation of the work more than the work itself. I just love to see how things come together and, and what happened along the way. And so <clears throat> um, in this spread, I'm really talking about how and, you know, once you start separating those keys from the keyboard too, in this prototype, I was just going to do one key and which I thought was going to be, yeah, no sweat. I'll pick a key. But like picking the key was like such an ordeal. I didn't know. I w ended up going with the control key, but it's, that's kind of interesting to have just the word control inside this work. 
And what would have happened if I used the pause key or the home key or the end key, delete? Like there's so many keys that like just seem to not really matter when you look at the keyboard, but when they're just a word isolated and maybe even elevated and put to the forefront by itself, um, it's kind of a different experience. And so I used vacuum forming for this. Uh, we have a vacuum former in Kenilworth. So I was experimenting with that. This is Fusion 360. The previous project was Rhino. This one is Fusion. Um, and then I have to like, you know, again, build it. So like thinking about the physical world, again, I, I'm kind of new to making. And so, um, you know, gravity is a thing. I have to build a structure to support this thing. What's that gonna be like? What's that gonna look like? And how's it gonna function? And so here's prototype one. And so for this, I just like literally took one of my modules from the previous project and kind of figured out how, how, how might I go about building a structure for that. <clears throat> and then there was lots of uh, feedback. If you remember on the last project, on the last keyboard, there was lights for every key, but that one was pretty freestanding. So the lights were, they didn't like reflect or bounce off of anything, but a few people responded to the lights in this prototype because it has a back to it and it has the enclosure. And so that light reflects and flickers off of um, everything around it because now there are things around it. And so that kind of turned out to be something because, you know, if I'm like putting these things to rest or burying them or like kind of like seeing them out, like a flickering candle kind of might be appropriate or a flickering uh, light of perhaps like damaged electronics or, you know, something malfunctioning kind of on its way out. So I was like, oh man, could that be something? That might be a way forward too. keep that light. And then here's parts, just tons of parts. I've definitely, you know, like I mentioned before, I do work in um, smaller parts and then assemble things. But with this and a lot of my work going forward, I've started to work in parts even more just because it allows me to iterate instead of on the whole piece over and over, which is very time consuming and it, to iterate on, but then also to 3D print and to make. Here, if I work in smaller parts, um, it brings in an aesthetic that I enjoy, but then from a very practical standpoint, I can just iterate on a very small section at a time uh, until I'm getting it to where I want. And so here's a couple more iterations. Um, these don't look too different from each other, though you'll no notice the one on the far right is bigger than the one on the far left. And so once I had set these up, I had already been thinking like maybe this could be a series with several different keys, but then having laid them out and looked at them, I was like, yeah, I think these could totally um, live next to each other. And then so the one on the right is a lot bigger because uh, the light thing really struck with a lot of people. They really had enjoyed that. And so did I too. And I felt like it really fit the theme of either a candle or a malfunctioning device or something along those lines. So I really want to explore that more as this project goes on. And so here I'm just trying to figure out how to integrate these lights. And so that <clears throat> that's what you can see here, that, that like magenta or orange in the middle one there. Um, those are LED um, like noodles. They feel like a, a tapeworm as somebody described them once. Um, they feel like a, a cooked noodle. And so you can kind of tuck them into places and they offer a, a pretty interesting um, effect, but then also nice possibilities of, of where that light can be integrated into the work. Oh boy, and then color too. Yeah, the slide. I don't know about color. Um, I'm kind of experimenting with color now. You know, as a designer, color is super important. You know, it's very meaningful. And so when I use it, I don't want to use it lightly. I know that there's going to be lots of extra information and cultural significance that gets brought in with that. But at the same time, a lot of the parts that I work with come with color. And so <clears throat> if we look at the part on the right, we'll see the um, that middle part is a solenoid. It has that yellow yellow color to it that's tape for the most part that's wrapped around it and then the key is that green up top and then the the kind of pcb breadboard and back definitely has copper in it and then it also has like that green kind of sickly looking color um so just considering like maybe i use those colors maybe not i don't know we'll see what happens and then here we are kind of this is where the project is at the moment Getting ready to be getting ready to be wired up. I definitely want that button to perhaps move by itself again, like in the previous project, but also maybe be pressable and clickable. And maybe all the lighting that's going to be in this um, might respond to that. And so I kind of have these these wires. You can I I'm still trying to figure out how I'm looking at them. I'm thinking they're either like holding up and supporting the work, or maybe they're lowering the work down into 
some space or maybe they're like a structure that's kind of putting it out on display for you to look at but i don't know we have to build it and and see what happens and see how i'm responding to it and show it to other people and see what they're thinking too and so that that's a wrap um <clears throat> thank you for looking at my keyboards and listening to my talk and come give me feedback on my work at some point i'd love to see what everybody thinks about it thank you